Spirelli Paranormal Investigations, Episode 5 Written by Kate Beret Narrated by Roberto Scarlato Chapter 1 Jack had been giving some thought to Spirelli Paranormal Investigations, where it had started and where it was going, what his long-term plans for the business were, and how he'd ensure both the businesses and his survival beyond the next case that came through the door. I'd actually like to see tomorrow, Bob. Several tomorrows, preferably with the business intact. His Arcan Sonny bud looked up at the sound of his name. He didn't move from his curled-up position in the client chair on the other side of Jack's desk. He just lifted his head and blinked, sleepy, puppy-dog brown eyes at Jack. The little fuzzy guy was great company, and Jack had thought so even before he'd discovered the impact Bob had on his business. Who would have thought that having a small, corkscrew-tailed critter living secretly in his shop would have such a startling effect? The junk shop had become a successful enterprise overnight due to Bob's presence. Jack remained mystified by the method. But at least now he knew to thank Bob when customers purchased odd objects in the shop he was certain he'd never acquired. Where had these mysterious items originated? Also an unanswered question. But Jack wasn't about to grill his fuzzy little benefactor. Sorry, buddy. Just thinking out loud. Go back to sleep. Bob squeezed his eyes shut, let out a tiny sneeze, and settled in to nap again. Jack scratched the day's growth of beard on his chin. He wasn't sure why, but Bob had started to hang out, nap, and visibly wander around the store a week or two after the resolution of his buddy Nelson's case. Whatever the reason, he was great company. Bob was like a warm blanket on a cold day but for the soul. Jack grunted, then leaned back in his chair. He was going nuts, or he needed more sleep. He scrubbed his face with both hands. So far, he'd only come up with one solution. The ring on his finger tightened, followed by the tinkling of the front doorbells and a flash of green sparkles in his peripheral vision. Marin. He rubbed his eyes, dry from lack of sleep, and when he opened them, Bob was gone. For whatever reason, Bob's recent sociability only extended to Jack. His furry buddy usually disappeared when anyone else was in the shop, even Marin. Jack didn't have long to consider the Bob conundrum. Marin came into the office and dropped into the chair vacated by Bob. You look like shit. Good morning. Bender? Wild night with a new lady? Marin crossed her arms. But that's not it, because you've looked like this every morning for more than a week now. Your ladies don't last that long, and you're coming into the shop early every morning. Inventory. Jack tapped a clipboard on top of his desk. Sure, except you don't do inventory. Ever. I do it. Just like I do the dusting and empty the trash and refill the supplies. She uncrossed her arms and leaned back in her chair. What exactly is it that you do again? Come on, not today. Jack rested his forearms on his desk. I have a proposition for you. She tilted her head, her curiosity clearly piqued. He opened his mouth, but the words didn't come out. Now or never, because asking wouldn't get any easier. He tried again. I'm tired of running into every situation we encounter, ill-prepared, ill-informed, and half-cocked. Her eyes narrowed, but she didn't say anything. Finally, she said, I can't argue. There does seem to be a tendency to fly by the seat of your pants on most of our cases. I'm not complaining. You brought it up. She wasn't going to make it easier. But she hadn't started in with the snark. While Jack was pretty damn sure the timing wasn't perfect, when would it ever be? And if it helped him get some damn sleep. He steeled himself and said, What do you think about a partnership? Marin's mouth opened. She blinked furiously, but no words emerged. Her brow furrowed, and she snapped her mouth shut. Then her phone rang with her dad's programmed ringtone, 
carry on wayward son, and whatever she'd planned to say was lost. Hey, Dad. Marin shifted her body away from Jack as she spoke. Marin listened for a few seconds and then shot Jack a look out of the corner of her eye. No problem. Jack's with me. She tapped the screen and then placed her phone on Jack's desk. Jack sat up in his chair and leaned toward the phone. Ewan. Jack. I understand you've been busy lately. Jack wasn't sure, but he might have heard some amusement in Ewan's voice. He glanced at Marin, but her gaze was firmly affixed to the phone. Is there something Spy can do for you? Jack asked. I've got a case for you. Actually, I'm acting on behalf of the IPPC library. IPPC would be your client, but you'll report to me. Interested? Jack still hadn't gotten a good read on Marin's reaction to the call, but work was work. Definitely interested. You know we'll need the details. Naturally, if you decline the case, the details remain between us. Marin stiffened, then deliberately crossed her arms. Jack flicked a paper clip at her. In a neutral tone, he said, Yes, that is how it normally works. IPPC has recently taken an interest in acquiring magical texts, Ewan said. We've got feelers out for book leads in both the magical and mundane communities. Jack caught Marin's eye, and she shrugged. Jack leaned forward and said, Sounds interesting. You have a local lead? Houston, Ewan said. But we don't have an asset there that I trust for this particular case. Marin perked up. Sal, I've forgotten his last name. The computer programmer guy that's worked for the firm before, isn't he still in Houston? He is, but he won't work. The book, ostensibly a compendium of home remedies, has significant monetary value. Ewan paused, and Jack and Marin shared a speculative look as they waited for him to explain. In addition to its intrinsic value, there aren't many undiscovered magical books, as you know. We also suspect the content is unique. It's possible there's information on geolocation. Whoa! Marin shifted closer to the phone. Yeah, that's a little outside Sal's pay grade. What evidence do you have? Geolocating wasn't that big a deal, was it? The IPPC librarians have traced ownership back to a particularly successful geologist that worked in the oil industry several decades ago, Ewan said. And then it disappeared and reappeared ten years ago in the hands of a farmer living and thriving in a drought-ridden area of central Texas. How did it come to your attention in the first place? Something must have tipped you off to try to trace the ownership. Marin must have seen Jack's confusion because she lowered her voice and said, There are no geolocator texts. It's a very exciting find, Ewan said. The knowledge base for geolocators is small, and we don't have any books with geolocating information other than some third-hand accounts. As to how IPPC learned about the book, it showed up in an online auction. The bidding pattern triggered our tracking software, primarily due to an over-eager bid for what should be a relatively low-value book. Once our librarian reviewed the provenance and pulled backgrounds on the former owners, she concluded there was a high probability of a magical influence. I still don't get it, Jack said. If you have questions about geolocating, you have contacts you can ask. Clifford, the guy in the castle in Wales, for one. Apparently, he's got some kind of live chat, a direct line of communication between him and IPPC. That's right, Ewan agreed. After your efforts retrieving him earlier in the summer, that was the agreed-upon solution. Jack raised his eyebrows. His efforts had been storming a paranoid genius's fortified castle. So how's the book any more valuable than Clifford the geolocator whiz? That's the issue here. The geologist and the farmer weren't geolocators. But they were magic users, Marin said. Ewan's reply came across the line in one tense, harsh syllable. No. Wow. Jack fell back in his chair. Shit, Marin said. 
silence followed. Jack was pretty damn sure that non-magical people couldn't acquire magic. Through his recent experience with the ancient dragon Joshua, Jack didn't dwell on his complicated feelings about that. He'd discovered that humans had a kernel of magic or they didn't. Ewan was implying a direct contradiction with the rules of the magical world as Jack understood them. If mundane people are cruising around the world geolocating, something is seriously awry, right? We are talking about the book imbuing its owner with some level of magical talent. We don't know that. But Ewan sounded grim, even as he denied the possibility. There are alternative explanations. Collusion with a magic user, a magical item. Marin snorted. That would be one big battery if it's a magical item. It's one thing to use magic to encode information on a book, because a record keeper also uses magic to retrieve that information. But a book that has enough juice to allow decades? Or more, Jack said. Marin just frowned and continued. Or more than decades of mundanes to use the book as some divining rod, not simple magic, then that is a seriously powerful magical item. I've never heard of such a thing, so we're talking nuclear equivalent. Or the users are figuring out how to recharge it, potentially revolutionary. As Ewan spoke, several beeps sounded in the background. I need to go. Here's the job. We need the book retrieved. Immediately. It's available on the open market. We need you to travel to Houston, make a very generous offer in person, but the offer needs to be contingent upon leaving with the book. Wait. If the book is up for auction, what exactly is IPPC's plan? Jack could feel the beginnings of a dull ache in his temple, because he already knew the answer. IPPC is prepared to bid competitively. Ewan's words lacked inflection. Yep, definitely an ache. Jack said, not helpful. Right, Marin said. If the seller isn't already aware of the book's unique properties based on the earlier high bid, he'll be curious as hell when we outbid it. Ewan sighed. We're not paying you as couriers. Sort it out. We'll cover your usual rates and expenses, and there's a bonus paid out once the book is safely under IPPC's control. Jack sat up straighter. He needed a new roof. What's the bonus? Harrington will forgive your outstanding debt. Jack's lips twitched. He owed Harrington a free job, one he'd planned to sick Marin on. And? A cash bonus. Ewan named a figure that would cover the cost of at least two roofs. Maybe Jack would have a look at those solar panels he'd been dying to install for so long. But he was never one to quit while he was only a half-step ahead. And? Ewan made a snorting noise that sounded a lot like Marin. <laughs> All right, I'll owe you a favor. No questions asked. Jack exchanged a glance with Marin. There was a tiny wrinkle right between her eyebrows that only showed up when she was annoyed and trying to hide it. Jeez, how did he even know that? He shook his head. Didn't matter. No way he'd pass. Yeah, it's a deal. I'm sending the file and the bidding information now, Ewan said. Call if you have any questions, but I've got a project that's blowing up right now, so if you don't catch me, try Harrington. As soon as Marin tapped end on her phone, Jack said, Talk. Marin raised an eyebrow. Why didn't you want the case? Jack propped his feet up on his desk. We had a... It doesn't matter. It's just family stuff. Nothing to do with the case. Marin studied the corner of Jack's desk intently. I mean, it's just weird to talk shop with him, but nothing specific about this case. Isn't that usually when you call him? About work? When we're in a jam or need information? Marin shrugged. Jeez, Marin, you're worse than me and my family. She perked up. You have family? Everyone has family. He thought about the question, about the partnership offer, about how long he'd known her. More politely, he said, Yes, I have family. 
I have a sister here locally. Anything else I need to know? About whatever is going on with you and your dad? She shook her head, then pulled out her cell from her pocket and checked the time. Prying into Marin's family crap beyond what was necessary for the job did not appeal, so... Right. Let's call this auction house or bookstore. Jack checked his phone for the file Ewan had promised. The bookstore is in West Houston. Let's call them and set up a viewing. We're taking your car? Uh, yes. Is your Cherokee even back from the shop? He ignored the question and dug out a can of crab. He didn't know when he'd be back, and he didn't want Bob to go hungry. Although when he was out of town, cans simply disappeared from his cupboard. Could an Arcan Sonny use a can opener? More accurately, did an Arcan Sonny need a can opener? Jack shook his head, too distracted by the upcoming case to dwell on the mysteries of magic hedgehogs. Chapter 2 Jack glanced at Marin when she jerked away in the passenger seat. She rubbed her eyes, then said, Thanks for driving. I haven't been sleeping all that well. Jack debated commenting on the fact that dragons needed less sleep than mere mortals like himself, and asking exactly how crappy her sleep had to be to need a nap. Con. Possible lengthy personal conversation. Pro. Avoiding some terrible outcome because he buried his head and ignored a possible problem. I'm fine, Jack. He couldn't miss the annoyance in her voice. What? I can see the wheels turning. You can be annoyingly transparent. I didn't want to pry. He shifted in his seat, trying not to squirm. Should I pry? He caught her head shake out of the corner of his eye and swallowed a sigh of relief. Several minutes passed before she said, It's not like you've been at your best recently. Hmm. He wasn't going to argue, but he also wasn't about to admit he wasn't sure what was causing his restless nights. Joshua? Hopefully not, because merging his physical self with some ancient dragon's essence wasn't supposed to actually change anything, except maybe stealing his peace of mind, maybe knowing that a big, bad, ancient, scaly bastard's life juice flowed through him, disturbed him. That would wreck any guy's sleep. Marin wasn't talking, so he had plenty of time to consider the state of his mental health, but why would he want to do that? Would that make him sleep better every night? And he needed a strategy for retrieving the book. Chance the auction? Entice with a high but not too high immediate purchase? Scope the place out for a possible burglary, followed, of course, by a substantial and anonymous contribution to the store? He rubbed his neck. Neither idea appealed, and prison sucked. IPPC's influence had limits, and Jack didn't want to end up in prison over misjudging them. They traveled in silence over an hour. When they hit Columbus, Jack pulled off the highway for gas. Marin had kept her eyes closed since they'd last spoke, but hadn't slept. As the truck slowed down to turn into the station, she opened her eyes. He rolled to a stop at the pump. Figured we'd get some gas. You can drive the rest of the way, and that gives me a chance to read over the file. Or I could just brief you, Marin said. Jack opened the driver's door and hopped out. Leaning across the front seat, Marin pitched her voice to Carrie and said through the open door, Or I could just drive, but you're a control freak. When he stepped back to the open door to respond, she met him with her creepy dragon grin, the one that was all teeth, and added, Partner? I'm not a control freak, and at this rate, you're not going to be my partner. He let annoyance creep into his voice, but swallowed a smile as he turned back to the pump. She'd been thinking about his offer. Jack finished at the pump and climbed into the passenger seat. Marin had pulled out his laptop and left it on the seat before she'd switched to the driver's side. Anything I should keep an eye out for? Jack asked as he flipped open his laptop. He pulled up the file Ewan had forwarded. Marin had spent several minutes reviewing it, and given how fast she read, 
she'd probably gone through the entire document at least three times. Zipping out of the lot fast enough to give him whiplash, she made a non-committal noise. Not much there beyond what he told us on the phone. A little more history on the players, but that's it. Long before they arrived at the small store in the West Houston suburbs, located in a strip mall, of all places, he'd read the file twice. Just as Marin had said, he hadn't found much useful information. He had discovered the reserve listing price, only a few hundred dollars. From what little he knew of old and rare books, the physical, mundane book sounded old and not actually rare. After checking online, Jack discovered the latest high bid, $75,000. The dealer had to have some inkling that there was a hidden value to the book. But, wild guess, the guy had no clue some long-ago spellcaster had stuffed a bunch of magical information inside the book. That, or used some other means to supercharge the magical mojo of the book. Jack almost felt bad for the poor mundane schmo. Jack had been that clueless guy, what seemed like a lifetime ago, but he still remembered how all of the pieces simply hadn't fit together the way they should. Marin slowed as they cruised through the strip mall parking lot. Jack checked the numbers on the store doors, then pointed ahead and to the right. Flip around to the back side of the strip mall. Hey, when we do the physical examination of the book, you can confirm the presence of magic, right? Marin shot him a narrowed-eyed look, and her eyes might have looked a little greener than normal. What? I know it takes a record keeper to read any encoded magical text, and you can't do that. I'm just checking. Her eyes lacking any obvious glow. Maybe he'd imagined that. She said, I should be able to get a vibe, including whether there's more going on than simply magically recorded data. Magical books still wigged him out. Any book could store the same information as a laptop, probably more, because the book was simply an anchor for the spells that held the information. I still don't get why record keepers don't pick a sturdier medium. Books seem like a fragile choice for information important enough to hide with magic. She snorted. That's because you don't think like a spellcaster. What had his longtime friend Kenna said? Her best friend was a record keeper. Something to do with the function of the anchor, making it easier for the record keeper to attach the spelled words to the item. That's it. When casting a spell, using relevant physical contexts or anchors to ground the magic can be tremendously helpful. You use magic items like any other tool, Jack. And I think you look at magic like it's a tangible thing. Your ring is an alarm system, and your glasses are basically magical binoculars. But they're not just tools. Magic is... It's pure imagination made tangible. Okay, so why not a typewriter? Or a stone tablet? Way sturdier. Same context. She gave him an annoyed look, then pulled into a spot in front of the store. It had a simple sign that read, Books but no one would mistake this tiny, shabby bookstore tucked away on the backside of a strip mall for a purveyor of bestsellers and genre fiction. Marin pulled into a parking space two spots away from a minivan. The only other car on the side of the strip mall was a beat-up old Civic, parked in the furthest spot from the shop's door. Jack eyed the store with some misgiving. Any guesses on which car is the store owner's? Pulling the keys out of the ignition, Marin said, I'll refrain from forming an opinion until we see the man's stock. He could be housing some gems in there. Jack climbed out of the truck. Best security ever. Everyone in the area thinks the place is a dump, so they don't bother to break in. Or perhaps not. Marin had stopped in front of the glass-fronted door and was peering intently inside. Do you have your gun? Yeah, but I'm not shooting an uber-geek civilian. The words flew out of his mouth on autopilot, but his body responded to the threat she'd identified. As he drew his back up 38, he stepped away from the door. Plan? Keep the two guys who are tearing the place apart from leaving with our book. You good with that? Sure thing. You got the unarmed civilian to the right? 
she motioned to the right front corner of the store. When he nodded, she gave him her toothy dragon grin. I'll take the disrespectful shits throwing books around. She motioned to eleven o'clock. Jack nodded. Marin started a countdown from three. Chapter Three One Marin pulled the shop door open. Jack slipped in and dipped right. A gasp revealed the exact location of a very large man cowering low in the corner. Jack ducked down beside him, just as a shot echoed through the room. Shaking his head as his ears rang, Jack leaned close to the man and said, Braithwaite? The guy looked at Jack like he'd gone mad. A thin line of flame streamed through the still-open door. An agonized scream followed. I hope you're Braithwaite, and those guys are actually robbing you because my partner just torched one of them. Yes, 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 yes. Jack had to put his hand on the guy's arm to get him to stop repeating the word. I'm your 1230 appointment. He flashed the terrified man a grin. We're a little early. The shop owner breathed out a barely audible, thank God. Jack could see a thin strip a slice of the shop between the register he'd hunkered down behind and the scattered bookshelves. He flipped his gaze from that narrow view to the door, then back again, waiting. He really had too much shit going on in his life. Someone was shooting at him, and he barely felt a rush. That was messed up. Marin appeared in the doorway before he could get too philosophical. Her movements were smooth and economical as she moved to join them. Looks like they've moved to a back room. Mr. Braithwaite? Jack touched the man's arm again. You have a back room? Braithwaite fell from his crouch to sit on the floor, as if the air had suddenly left him. He nodded furiously. Jack guessed at the reason for the sudden release of tension. There's another exit, isn't there? Another nod from Braithwaite was followed by a massive crash from the back of the store. Shit! Marin ran to the back. You stored the auction book in the back room? Jack touched the man's arm when he didn't respond. Mr. Braithwaite, the book? Yes, yes, the back room. Several seconds passed. Then the front door opened. Jack raised his gun. Not that he doubted Marin's ability to kick two guys' asses and walk away. He lowered his gun as Marin walked in. They're long gone. She lifted her phone. I got a shot of their license plate, but I doubt it'll help. I texted it to my dad, the license and some other info on the book. Figured we'd use his contacts to pull the registration and a police report if it was stolen. Jack nodded. He turned to consider the pale countenance of the shop owner. They could hardly leave Braithwaite here to report an uncontrolled story to the police. Mr. Braithwaite? Jack offered him a hand up. Let's talk expenses. We'd very much like to cover the costs of this incident, in exchange for a few small considerations. Chapter 4 When Jack left the shop, he clutched a receipt for a compendium of home remedies in his hand. While possession would have been infinitely better, my PPC now held legal claim to the book. Mr. Braithwaite had been rather surprised by the generous offer for a book that he had said was a very nicely preserved example, but otherwise unremarkable. Mr. Braithwaite happened to be one of the few honest men left in the world, a fact that became painfully obvious when they'd begun negotiations for the book and his cooperation. He claimed the excellent condition of the book and a resurgence of interest in natural remedies had slightly elevated the value, but he stressed that the value could never rise to the level Jack was offering to pay. Let's hope Mr. Braithwaite's memory remains suitably vague after his vacation in Belize, and that Harrington doesn't have a heart attack when he gets the tab. Marin pulled the truck keys from her pocket. After she hopped in the driver's seat, she said, And what was with the whole laser thing? What else would you call a thin blue flame? Jack shrugged. I was in the moment. High tech seemed a better choice than magic. And speaking of pinpoint laser flames, your control of fire in human form has improved, 
or the neighbors got an eyeful of scaly lizard lady. She turned to him with a bland expression, then backed the car out of the space. No, she'd have to be insane to flash her elephant-sized self in a strip mall parking lot. He examined her face, and she looked too innocent. You're shitting me. How do we explain that away? Cutting-edge laser tech is bad enough. What, PCP exposure? Uh, filming a commercial? With hidden cameras? How about a rip in time allowing dinosaurs into our world? Marin readjusted her rearview mirror slightly. Besides, it's only a problem if there's a witness. Jack snorted. And you ate them before you came inside, so no worries? Don't be an ass. Would you rather have been shot? Not really. She waved a hand vaguely in the direction of the parking lot behind them. And look around. There isn't a soul. I've no idea how Elliot Braithwaite was making a living with that place. Especially in this area. It's been hit hard recently. Recently unemployed and underemployed are not our Mr. Braithwaite's bread and butter. If you had more respect for vintage comics, you'd probably have spotted them in the shop. Jack had caught sight of a handful in the back room when they'd verified the book's theft. He gave her almost pristine car a hard look. Come to think of it, you have a distinct lack of respect for all things vintage, but vintage comics might bring in some cash for him. Dragons live in the now, I've told you that, and sometimes it's easier surrounded by new things. Glancing out of the corner of her eyes, she said, And your Jeep isn't vintage. It's a piece of shit you need to replace. Now she was just trying to piss him off. He opened up his laptop, then remembered her comment about the book. What other information did you get on the book? Oh, shit, that's right. Death magic. The shop, the back room especially. The book is obviously the source. Even the parking lot reeked after our shooters made off with the book. Death magic, as in dead people juicing up the book and powering its magic? When she tipped her head once in affirmation, he asked, How in the hell did you spot that before we even went in the back room? If death magic were a smell, it was stinking up the entire store. That's a lot of death. She glanced at him and raised her eyebrows. That's a powerful book. Jack couldn't help but dwell on exactly how powerful. The little experience he had with death magic had given him a healthy respect for the sheer magnitude of magical power it generated. One death had powered a containment ward for more than a hundred years. That was serious shit. He forced himself to turn his attention to his laptop. He wanted another look at the book's provenance, as well as the research done by the in-house IPPC librarian, and freaking out like a kid who just watched his first horror flick wouldn't help. By the time he'd settled into his research, several minutes had passed, and he realized he had no clue where they were headed. Where are we going? Are you going to tell me what you're doing? Maybe the partnership offer had been premature. Then again, she had just dragon lasered a bad guy. That was pretty badass, and probably partner worthy. Hey, how'd your flame victim manage to get away? Jack asked. Ah, I aimed to disable. Figured we wanted to question them. But his buddy just dragged him along. That was enough experimentation with non-lethal force for this decade. Once he had the relevant docs open, he pulled up his old research buddy Christine's contact information. Married and with some unknown number of kids running around, she'd done very little freelance research for him lately, but this was an emergency. He tapped call. Hey, Chris. How's my favorite research assistant? He spent five minutes updating her on the request and skirting questions about the case. The client was another matter. He asked her to copy Ewan on the results. When he ended the call, he realized they were pulling up to a cheap hotel they'd passed on the way into town. More private than a restaurant, and we can order pizza when we get hungry. Marin pulled into the covered temporary parking area for registering guests. You're paying for the pizza and the hotel. What, like I wouldn't? 
Chris says give her a few hours and she should have a list of suspicious deaths and disappearances near the last owner's hometown. It's a little place about an hour southeast of Austin. Marin got out of the car and waited for him to join her. As he rounded the front of the truck, she said, You remember that back during the 2011 drought? He bought out a number of struggling family-owned farms? Not in and of itself terrible, but he managed to profit immensely by installing or upgrading irrigation systems and implementing more modern farming practices. Jack paused. But where'd the water come from? Right. Thinking about all of those bankrupt farmers, it makes me curious to know how he died. Wishing a horrible and lingering illness on someone might make you a bad person. Jack opened the lobby door for her. She shrugged. Not if he deserved it. Out of perverse curiosity, Jack popped off a text to Chris asking her how Albright had died. That information hadn't been included in the file. And if the successful Mr. Albright had murdered a bunch of locals to power his water-divining book, then, yeah, the guy might have deserved a horrible and lingering illness. And that was why they'd make decent partners. They agreed on the important shit. Chapter 5 Jack was in the middle of eating a piece of almost hot pizza when Christine returned his call. He still hadn't heard from Ewan, but Marin hadn't seemed surprised when he mentioned it earlier. Jack answered and tapped speaker. Hey, Chris, I've got Marin with me. Color me shocked. How have you not flame-broiled him yet, Marin? And, Jack, I say that with love in my heart. Marin grabbed another slice and dropped down on the bed. He's an angel. A cheap, sentimental, slightly sleazy angel. Chris laughed. You guys are spending way too much time together. Jack couldn't help noticing his longtime buddy didn't bother to deny a word of Marin's criticism. Cheap, sleazy. Since when am I sentimental? Marin swallowed a bite of pizza. The Jeep. Almost at the same time, Chris said, Your car. Enough about Jack and his many failings. The laughter had died from Chris's voice. She was suddenly all business. Open the zip file I sent you. There's a photo compilation inside. Got it. Jack clicked the file labeled Montage, then blew up the image. Holy shit. Marin flipped his computer around, greasy fingers and all, so she could see the screen. She shoved the last bite of her pizza into her mouth and belatedly looked around for something to wipe her fingers on. Jack handed her a handful of paper napkins. Marin snatched the napkins, but then her attention immediately pivoted to the screen. These look like crime scene photos. Is that legit? Jack and I have a don't ask, don't tell agreement, so no comment. You see the pattern? How could anyone miss it? One photo after another of slashed victims jumped off the screen at Jack. How could the FBI miss it? Excellent question, Chris said. Creative wording, failing to report, but I don't have a good answer. The kids are about to get home, have to run. I'll keep poking around and we'll check in with additional information. Thanks, Chris. Jack ended the call, and then set his phone on the nightstand, well away from any pizza grease. I'd like to know what local law enforcement have to say. Marin barely kept bits of food from flying as she spoke around the pizza in her mouth. Similar knife wounds that would have all caused massive blood loss. Jack winced. Might ask if you were raised by wolves, but the ones I've met have better table manners than you. Marin swallowed, wiped her mouth, and then chucked the wadded-up napkins onto the nightstand. Brachial, carotid, and femoral arteries cut. All injuries that would have caused massive blood loss and the injuries appeared to have been made with some sort of blade. A clear pattern. How could the locals not have seen it? She lifted a finger toward the screen. Hey, not the screen! Yanking her hand back, she scowled at him. Something's off. These should have been recognized as possibly the work of one person. First, there were seven murders in ten years. 
Second, look at the locations. Jack pulled up a county map on his computer. Pointing to the area just southeast of Austin, he circled the relevant area with his fingertip. They're spread over four, maybe five counties. Even so, seven murders in such a low population density area? Something's hinky. And where's the news coverage? Serial killer on the loose in central Texas. That kind of thing. Someone's hushed these up. Marin rolled off the bed and disappeared into the bathroom. Jack could hear the water in the sink running. He pitched his voice to be heard above the water. If they didn't want the murders discovered, why a cover-up? I'd make sure no one found the bodies. She came back, drying her hands on a small towel. We both know I'd just incinerate them. Did you get the files as well, or just the pictures? We've got the files. Give me a second, and I'll forward them. When he was done, he said, Code Red Files. Is Code Red the one where I get fired if the info leaks, or the one where I have to clean your car? She glanced at the little blue telephone box replica in her hand, and then frowned at him. He gave her a blank stare. The one where I leave old french fries to petrify under the driver's seat of your car. But I'll consider firing you. I will be very careful. The two of them spent some time familiarizing themselves with the files, but it was only an hour or so later that Chris sent them an update with Mr. Stanley Albright's cause of death. And then they changed the focus. Albright's death had been ruled a suicide. The 65-year-old farmer turned businessman had slashed his wrists vertically. No history of previous attempts was documented in his medical files. In fact, there was no record of depression at all. For the next several hours, they dug through the files looking for some connection between the victims, something beyond Albright to tie them together. Albright may or may not have orchestrated what were looking more and more like sacrificial murders, but it looked like he wasn't the linchpin. The man could hardly be the linchpin if he was also a victim. Jack's phone chirped as a new text message came in. He blinked and rubbed his burning eyes. Too much reading and not enough blinking. He opened the message. Church of the book. And tell Chris she'd like working for us. He replied, I don't work with clients who steal my contractors. As an afterthought, he added, Thanks. Hey, your dad just texted me. Have you seen anything about a church of the book? No, but hold on. Marin pulled her laptop closer and started clicking and tapping. Here, it looks like a woman was questioned closely because of a previous assault against her husband. She was discounted based upon a confirmed alibi, provided by her church. Well, they would give her an alibi if one of them slit her husband's throat, wouldn't they? Just because they use the word book in the name, it doesn't mean anything. That could easily be a reference to the Bible. Marin tapped a few keys and then said, Ouch! Her husband's injury was to the femoral artery, sliced in the groin. Now that sounds like something an angry wife might either do or have done to her husband. And a fantastic way to torture a guy. Don't move, buddy, or we might miss. Jack resisted the urge to cover his junk. Sure, the guy was worried about his dick right before he was brutally murdered. She didn't look up, just kept scrolling through the file. I don't see any reference to the name of the church in here. That's odd, right? Uh, yeah. Hey, I found a website. Jack flipped the screen around for her. Like all good nonprofits, they've ensured there's an easy way to donate online. Three physical locations. Jack switched back to the county map. Yeah, all three church locations are well within that five-county region I showed you before. And there's only one pastor for all three branches. Road trip? Sounds like a plan. She snapped her laptop shut. You're driving. I read faster, and I want one more look through those files for any hint of a church or a religious group. But try not to drive like a little old lady. Chapter 6 Where's all the blood? 
Jack had been driving about an hour now, and it had been bugging him for several miles. What? Marin pulled her attention away from her laptop. What blood? Exactly. What blood? The crime scene photos show no blood from wounds that would have bled profusely. So where is it? And going with your local law enforcement involvement theory, the missing blood from each scene should also have tied the murders together. Marin turned off the music. Since only about half of the victims appear to have been moved, according to the case files, and there's no sign the scenes have been tidied when the victims weren't moved, the murderer or murderers must have collected the blood. My vote's for the blood being integral, to the sacrifice. So how does that work? How should I know? No super-secret dragon knowledge about blood sacrifices? Or what about Ewan? Is he ever going to get back to us on the death magic aspect? When he has something, he'll let us know. Jack's phone chirped with a text alert. Can you get that? Marin entered his passcode, a code he'd never given her, and tapped the screen. Chris is sending a background for each of the victims and a summary of some interesting financial data on the church. Give me a sec, and I'll pull it up on my laptop. On the hotspot I only use for work. That I pay for myself. Jack mentally added cell and hotspot reimbursement to the offer he had prepared. A few minutes later, Marin whistled. The church of the book is loaded. Albright must have propped them up. A small church in an area with a dwindling population that's been decimated by drought. How else does a tiny church have full coffers? Wrong. I've got a list here of donors that boggles the mind. Albright, the sheriff, a deputy, no, two deputies, a county judge, and a few connected politicians who aren't local to the area. And those are just the high rollers. Jack felt a pulsing throb in his temple. The nasty stench of that cover-up you suspected is growing stronger. How do you think Harrington would feel about a cross-county cover-up if all this goes sideways? Pissy. Jack swallowed a laugh. Pissy wasn't a word that came to mind when he thought of Harrington. Given our track record, we might just see. Yeah, about that. Maybe let's minimize the damage? I'm wounded. I always do my best. Marin declined to respond and turned the music back up. So things occasionally blew up, and he got shot at pretty regularly, and there was that time he was possessed. Jack figured a cleanup call to Harrington almost definitely loomed in his future. Jack turned off the main drag to one of the few side streets located in downtown Lorietta. Hard to get lost. Forget that. With a population of around 5,000, it's hard to imagine so many big fish donors in the area, especially given the recent economic climate, Marin pointed. Up there on the right, you see it? Uh, he didn't see it. Unless the Church of the Book was masquerading as an old metal building, it looked more like a warehouse than a church. Then he saw the sign with clear block letters reading, Church of the Book. The sign was old and faded, and, much like the building, gave an impression of limited funds and a long history. Not spending their cash on rent. No. Jack pulled into the gravel lot and parked in the shade under a massive live oak. No other cars were in the lot, unless church employees parked elsewhere. Assuming the church was even big enough to have any, the building appeared unoccupied. As he approached the metal building, he realized why the place had such a familiar feel. It looked like any other small-town community center in any other underpopulated central Texas town. If the appearance is anything to go by, I doubt the building's occupied except for services. As they reached the door, Marin pointed to the small placard with the church's hours listed. Two services on Sunday— and an evening service on Wednesdays. They might be out of luck to meet the minister or staff, since it was a Tuesday. Three services for a small church that gives the appearance of being underfunded and serves a town of 5,000? Jack asked. Don't forget the other two locations. 
The same pastor serves all three churches. She turned to try the door, then glanced back at Jack when it swung open. Maybe someone's cleaning? Jack paused at the threshold, then whispered, We're thinking about moving to the area. Sure, honey bunch. Jack nodded, and Marin opened the door wide. The temperature difference as he crossed the threshold made him pause. Old metal buildings were notorious for having poor insulation and being a bitch to keep comfortable, and yet the interior of the building was cool and dry, and on a day with no services, and not one car in the church's lot. He paused at the entrance, allowing his eyes to adjust to the dimmer light. By the time he could see well enough to differentiate large shapes, a man had spotted them and was approaching. Maybe letting the dragon with preternaturally keen eyesight to go first wouldn't hurt. Hello! Welcome to the Church of the Book. How can I help you? A man in pressed khakis and a polo shirt stood smiling at them. His medium brown hair was close-cropped, and his smile automatic. Jack extended his hand. I'm Jack, and this is my girlfriend, Mary. We're looking at moving in the next few months. You know, get out of the city, away from the high property taxes and the traffic. We saw the sign and figured if anyone was in... As Jack spoke, the man shook his hand firmly and then turned to Marin. She smiled in greeting, but didn't offer her hand. Yes, of course. I'm Pastor Rick, and I'm happy to help if I can. What questions do you have? I guess, what's it like to live here? Jack took a casual step closer to Marin, putting her at girlfriend rather than colleague distance. It's quieter than Austin, certainly. We've got a mix of farmers and ranchers. Can I ask what you do? Oh, sure. I'm a writer. Living in the country, writing on the porch. Jack shrugged. It's always been a dream of mine. And I do medical transcription, so I can really work anywhere. Marin had pitched her voice higher, and she sounded so unlike herself that Jack had to stop himself from doing a double take. Well, you won't want to be too far out of town so your internet service is more reliable. I know a few houses that might fit the bill. Are you looking to buy or rent? It really depends on what's available. Jack looked around the room at the neatly lined up chairs and the altar. Do you get a good turnout for services? We do. I'm fortunate that Laurietta's residents are a devout group. Jack paused waiting for an invitation to join the service, scheduled for the following day. When none was issued, he said, So are you from here originally? No, Dallas, but I've lived here for several years. Basically a local, right? Jack gave him a genial smile. Do you live here in town, or out in the country? A little out of town. Marin leaned closer to Jack and bumped against him affectionately. That's what I think we should do, but Jack would rather be directly in town. Well, if you don't have any other questions... Pastor Rick looked in the direction of the door. Right, we need to get going. Jack turned to the door, then paused and said, One last question. If you were looking to move out of Austin, would you settle in Laurietta? Absolutely. Thank you, Pastor Rick. We appreciate your time. Jack reached out and shook the man's hand again. Good luck to you both. And Jack and Marin exited the church in silence, and only when they'd both settled into the Range Rover did Marin comment. That was weird as hell. Damn right it was. Sure, move to our town, but don't come to our church services. No invitation to Wednesday's service, no tour, and no questions about our own religious beliefs. It's been a while since I've been in a church, but that should be standard. He's a man of God. You'd think he'd expressed some interest in our beliefs after we walked into his church. Yeah, and I agree. If something shady is happening in Laurietta or with the church, you'd think he'd have warned us off the town. Turn right, Marin pointed at the exit. We can see if our pastor might be parked in the street. And I want to circle through the main square, then get a room at that sketchy motel we passed on the way into town. 
Don't suppose I have a choice? Not really. What? Don't tell me you have plans. Apparently I have plans for a midnight break-in, Marin said. No wards that I could detect, but they could very well be arming them when no one is there. Jack scrubbed his jaw. We haven't encountered anyone with magic yet. I'm betting no wards. Old-fashioned security, maybe, but no magic. This entire case has a very mundane feel. Except for the stench of death magic all over the bookshop, I'd agree. I don't really understand how these people got mixed up with death magic. Any hint of death magic unleashes the wrath of the entire magical community. Jack coughed back to laugh. We're in Central Texas. What magical community? The Lycan? They have their own problems, and this wouldn't appear on their radar. The Coven of Light? Hell, they'd join in. No, not the Coven. I mean, yes, they would join in. I think we know how enamored of death magic they are. But there's no indication of their involvement. And what's with the players? A judge, cops, a council member, the large geographic spread? It's all so improbable without some larger context. If the church is involved, and my money's on them being ass deep, then that's the nexus. And what do all of the contributors have in common? Wealth, power, influence? Marin buckled her seatbelt. Cop up ahead. Pretend like you know how to drive and where you're going. Jack drove exactly the speed limit as he passed the small police station with a single cruiser parked out front. Could the entire town be involved? If the minister of the Church of the Book was a key player, then what were the broader implications? The sensation of being watched, like a bug under a magnifying glass, made him glance around the empty streets. Suddenly, this typical Central Texas small town felt like the setting of a horror flick, eerily empty and suspiciously run down. A few minutes later, when they were about halfway to the motel, Marin said, Don't make a fuss, but I think we're being followed. The car behind has made the last three turns with us. That might explain the uneasy sensation he'd been feeling since they'd left Lorietta. Unfortunately, there was a long stretch of road ahead with no turnoffs. He kept traveling, the same speed, and without obviously checking his rearview mirror, until they reached the motel. He verified the dark blue sedan was still behind him, and then kept driving past the motel. How far to the interstate from here? Marin pulled her phone out and fiddled with her navigation. About three miles. Jack had only gone another mile when the old blue sedan sped up and passed them. He took his foot off the gas and watched as the car sped past. I hate to sound overcautious, but maybe skip the motel? Marin scanned the area. The Range Rover was hardly inconspicuous, and even less so in a dive motel parking lot. We'll camp out at the shop, between your place, my place, and the junk shop. It's the shortest drive to the church. You're sure that's still a good plan? If they were following us... Right, I get it. Pastor Rick sent them. Let's say you're right. Getting out of Lorietta isn't a bad idea, and we'll just return... cautiously. He pulled out in the road, ignoring Marin's mumbled reply. Cautiously, my ass. Chapter 7 Jack set his alarm for eleven that evening, just in case he fell asleep and Marin didn't keep a close eye on the time. Hitting the church somewhere between midnight and one seemed like a good idea. No neighborhood dogs abutting the church property, poor street lighting, no neighborhood watch signs, and a tiny police presence all combined to make their break-in job easier. Marin poked her head into the room. I'm going to sort through those last few boxes of inventory before we have to leave again. The chunk I picked up after that big garage sale and the burbs shut down? I thought you finished that stuff already. Marin gave him a narrowed-eyed look, but didn't respond before she left. Oh, yeah. He'd mentioned helping with stocking and pricing when he'd unloaded them a few days ago, and then forgot. Since Marin was still an employee, for now, 
she could suck it up. He cleared some paperwork, some miscellaneous junk, and an old blanket off his couch. When he lifted the blanket, he found Bob curled up snugly under it. Bob cracked one eye open, then the other. Mind to share, buddy? The little guy stood up and yawned, stretched, and then moved to the end of the sofa. Jack still found it unnerving that Bob looked so much like a corkscrew-tailed Labrador puppy, and yet he understood more of the events around him than many people Jack knew. And why do they call you guys lucky hedgehogs? You and your buddy Nelson don't look anything like hedgehogs. Jack thought he saw a hint of a smile on Bob's canine-like snout. Unfortunately, without Marin, he couldn't communicate with Bob. Except for that one time, but that had been a one-off, and it happened right after he and Joshua had done their energy-essence merging thing. Jack slipped his shoes off. Watch the feet, little guy. Bob scooted further toward the corner of the couch and closed his eyes. He was such an agreeable guy. If Jack could find a roommate for the house that was half as helpful, he stretched out and fell asleep. A nudge against his side, a nibble on his fingers. Wake up, wake up, wake up. A tickle at the back of his neck. Watched, watching. Someone watched. Teeth scraped sharply against his knuckles. Ow! Jack jerked upright as Bob disappeared. What the... Hands jerked his shoulders, his ankles. He tumbled to the floor. His right hip throbbed. His gun. He reached for his ankle holster. Too slow. Pain exploded in his shoulders. Arms twisted high above his head. He looked, but couldn't see Marin. Another jerk. This time his ankles. The muscles in his legs strained. His head thumped against the concrete floor. He needed to get up. He couldn't. Large hands pulled, yanking across carpet, concrete. Concrete abraded his jaw, his cheek, the back of his head. The pressure on his joints released. His numb hands and useless legs dropped to the floor. A ripping sound, duct tape, and his ankles were bound. He struggled, tried to struggle but a man slammed his head against the floor. He tried to roll, push away, anything. Wrists taped, feet taped. He couldn't move. Every fiber said fight. His body wouldn't move. Acrid, choking, smoke, Marin. Stinging eyes, more smoke. Where was Marin? One man at his feet, another at his shoulders. Joints strained. He swayed in the air, floated. Jack swallowed back bile. The smoke. What was with the smoke? A last glimpse of the store. One corner charred. No flames. Only smoke. Where was Marin? His shoulders fell. Blood rushed to his head. His vision narrowed. The floor vibrated. Jack's eyes watered when the floor lurched. The sudden, sharp pain in his head brought him back to the present. He was in a car, in a trunk. The same damn blue sedan that had followed he and Marin earlier, if he had to guess. No telling how long he'd been out. He lifted his taped hands to his head. Some of the blood was dry. So a while. Marin. Shit. What had happened to her? Hell, he didn't have any time to worry about her. He had to save his own ass. He rolled to face the taillights. Too late he remembered his bruised hip, and a grunt of pain escaped. He lay still, waiting for some sign his attackers had hurt him. But the car continued on at the same speed. He tried again, this time stealing himself for the wave of pain. Cold sweat coated his body, as his head thumped painfully in time with his pulse. He would not puke in the trunk of a car. No. Just no. When he'd caught his breath, he felt for the release latch. With any luck, the assholes who grabbed him hadn't thought to disable it. With each twisting effort, his head thudded. The constant reminder that he was concussed wasn't doing much for his patience. He fumbled a third time but couldn't find a release. Shit. 
It was that old damned sedan. No emergency release. And breaking out the taillights would only alert his captors that he'd awakened without improving his chances of popping open the trunk. He rubbed his ankle against the bottom of the trunk. And they'd taken his gun. Not surprising, but it pissed him off anyway. He inched his body away from the rear of the trunk to give himself some maneuvering room, then lifted his hands to his mouth. With enough time, he could get the tape off and at least come out of the trunk fighting. Just because they wanted him alive now didn't mean they intended to keep him that way. He'd worried about a quarter-inch tear in the tape around his hands when the car decelerated. It felt like they were exiting a highway or interstate. Jack focused all of his energy on the duct tape. If they arrived before he freed his hands and feet, he'd be helpless. He ignored the tiny voice in the back of his head that said they'd be armed, and bound or not, he was screwed. But that little voice wasn't any damn help. None at all. Half an inch. Just a little more time. The car slowed and turned, the crunch of gravel under the tires giving away their location, the church of the book parking lot. Jack would bet cash on it. The car rolled to a stop. Chapter 8 Jack calmed his breathing, pushed away the pain, and readied himself for a final effort. One car door opened and slammed shut, then the other. The sound of crunching gravel neared, stopped, and then moved further away. Gradually, the sound of footsteps disappeared. Jack strained to hear any sign that someone was outside the car, but he couldn't block out the pounding of his own pulse in his ears. He turned back to his restraints. He needed to focus on one thing, one thing at a time, and he might stay conscious and have some chance. He gnawed on duct tape till the ache in his jaw started to compete with his pounding head. Finally, the last strands gave way. At well over six feet, Jack took up most of the space in the trunk. Reaching his feet proved more difficult than he'd guessed. With some careful shifting and rolling, he tucked his knees up close enough to his chest that he could touch the tape on his ankles. It took more than a dozen tries, but he finally found the edge of the tape with his cramped, numb fingers. Unwinding it in the tight confines of the trunk also proved a challenge, and by the time he'd finished, he'd exhausted himself. Without some serious painkillers or a healer, he wasn't about to put up any kind of fight when that lid popped open. Jack. Jack's head jerked up when he heard Marin's voice. He narrowly missed pounding his head for the second time, or was it third, time that night. Shit, Marin, where the hell are you? Above the church parking lot. No. It might be the middle of the night, and Marin might have the best camo skin known to dragon kind, but the church was still in the middle of a populated town, and Dragon Marin was the size of an elephant. You have lost your mind. Probably. Long story short, I'm stuck as a dragon. A few seconds of silence followed. Hug the floor of the trunk. Why? But Jack didn't wait for an answer. He flattened himself as best he could. The temperature in the trunk increased. As the air grew heavy with the heat, Jack kept as still as he could. He had no clue what the hell she was doing. And even with precise control and all the advantages of magical fire, he couldn't be sure touching the wrong part of the car wouldn't fry him. The screech of tearing metal made his head explode in pain. As his head thudded, he envisioned massive claws tearing into metal inches from his back. You can open your eyes now. He could hear the smirk in her voice. Don't even. You try being the sardine in a tin can opened with sharp pliers. Jack lurched over the jagged edges of metal where Marin had ripped the trunk from the car. She stretched her long, silvery neck out, giving him something that wouldn't rip his hands apart to lean on. You couldn't break in and just pop the damn trunk? All dragon all the time. Pay attention, Jack. And hurry. They'll have heard the noise. You think? 
Jack's hand slid down the cool, flexing scales of her neck as she turned to watch the church door. You have an exit plan? We need to retrieve the book. And a knife. Now? Jack did a quick inventory. Concussion, bruising, muscle strain, but no broken bones. If his brain wasn't bleeding, he was probably good to go. Slowly. And with no gun. Wait, what knife? The church doors opened. Marin's neck arched, and her jaws opened wide. A thin stream of flame scorched the open door. Whoever was making their way out retreated back into the building. You're going to explain this terrible plan at some point, right? Tomorrow. Cute. Those guys could be escaping out the back. There's an exit on the opposite side of the building. I melted the lock and sealed the windows. Jack stood up taller and stretched his shoulders. All right, seriously, what's the plan? Burn a hole in the building, enter, incapacitate a few guards, find a gun for you. Marin turned her attention from the church door to him, her neck snaking around for a glimpse back to the church. I'm stuck in dragon form for a while. When we're not about to die, how about you explain that? Jack rolled his head from one side to the other. The pounding in his head was scrambling his brains. But he didn't really have time for an Aleve run. Huge reptilian eyes stared down at him. We need to get a move on. I have to get home before the sky lightens. Right. Since he'd been telling his body to move for several seconds and it wasn't complying... Jack figured he wasn't actually up to a fight, but then his second wind must have kicked in because his legs started to work again and he headed to the door. Marin moved her massive bulk with an eerie ease, keeping pace with him. No windows on this side of the building, and he hadn't heard breaking glass. But there was no telling what the pastor and his congregation had gotten up to while he and Marin had been outside, not communicating. Any clue how many people are inside? Six. Marin moved in front of Jack as they got close to the front door. She may have baby scales that were soft by dragon standards, but she was still less vulnerable to gunfire than he was. He kept his hand on the silvery scales of her back, left haunch as they approached. Don't get close enough for hand to hand. That knife will kill you on contact and Jack had his answer to several questions. A knife that would kill him, and seriously mess up a dragon. Probably how he'd been nabbed to begin with. He'd been grabbed after Marin had been incapacitated by this mysterious knife. What's it look like? The scales under his hand vibrated, and he walked through a small puff of steamy air. Was she laughing? It looks like a knife. Without warning, Marin rocked back on her muscular haunches and shot a wide burst of blue flame at the building. Jack peered around her and watched as a hole appeared in the side of the building, and then the flames simply disappeared. Someday he'd stop expecting magical fire to behave like normal fire. It took a moment for his eyes to adjust after the quick flash. The scales under his hand moved, and Marin was several feet in front of him by the time he could see all of her bulk. And yet she moved with unexpected speed. Jack jogged behind her. At least the adrenaline had finally kicked in, and his head didn't explode with each step. The hole they entered was easily twice Marin's width. She'd approached at an angle to minimize their exposure, and a split second before stepping through, she shot a burst of steam through the entrance. As a scream shattered the air, Jack realized he hadn't even known that Marin could blast steam. He needed a dragon resume. He would add that as a stipulation of their partnership agreement. Heading right. Shots rang out and Marin snaked around the corner to the right, a pale shape in the darkness. Jack said a silent prayer that his memory of the interior was accurate and then dove to the left. His hip protested as he landed on the bruised area. And there was the table he'd recalled, four feet away. He huffed out a pained breath. 
Nothing but some folding chairs and open air between the angry assholes with guns and him. Add in a little moonlight, and here he was. A lovely target. He scanned the area. Parboiled dead guy at three o'clock. A little cover? He whispered the request, but he knew exactly how exceptional Marin's hearing was. Three, two, one... On one, Jack dove for the corpse. The room lit up with the brilliance of a small star, and he grabbed the corpse's gun. Half lunging, half crawling, he made it to the table, and after a few half-blind tries, he got the heavy, 70s-era piece on its side, much sturdier than he'd remembered. The bright flash had imprinted on his retina, and he closed his eyes, waiting for it to fade. Too long... He hunkered down behind the thick wood table, blind. Finally, he checked the Glock 17 he retrieved to ensure it hadn't been damaged by its high-heat steam bath. Seventeen rounds. The guy hadn't even fired his weapon. Glancing to his right, he found Marin's pale form curled up in the corner. Her eyes were watchful, so she was simply making herself a smaller target. The silence had stretched too long. The pastor's flock had escaped through an unknown third exit, or they were hidden in a back room. Are we clear? Probably. Four left. Steam-fried guy, and maybe a toasted second man when she'd let loose the mini-nova. Jack searched for the second dead body, but came up empty. You good? Good enough. He could hug the left wall of the building or head up the center between two blocks of folding chairs to the altar. He could only see one set of doors in the back right corner of the building. One door? Yes. When I hit the altar, move forward. Jack flipped that imaginary coin that lived inside his head and headed to the wall. As he passed two windows, he checked for activity outside. Nothing. It had easily been three, maybe four minutes since Marin tore off a chunk of metal from the sedan. At some point, the police had to show. Or the neighbors. Someone. They were making a hell of a lot of noise. He followed the wall past the corner, but there were no windows on this side of the building. Probably because the room on the other side ran the length of the building. As he hit the altar, Marin started along the far wall. Chairs crashed as she moved. Bull in a china shop, dragon in a church. What did he expect? She could be slippery as an eel, but that didn't change her size. He held up a hand for her to stop. He didn't want to announce their entrance. Another chair fell, and he looked closer. In the dim light, he could barely make out the darker smudges that streaked her side. Shit. In a whisper, he asked, Were you shot? Silence. Shit. Definitely more than once. Maybe he wouldn't have to worry about that partnership deal, since they'd both be dead momentarily. Can you just burn the whole damn building down? Not if we want the book. Jack considered the fee, the bonus, the favor. We want the book. Her response at least confirmed she wasn't in imminent danger of death. Right. Cover me. Jack lowered his borrowed gun and ran. What should have been a sprint turned into more of a jog. His legs simply wouldn't pump as fast as he needed. And yet, no gunfire. As he moved the chairs silently out of the way, he asked, What the hell are they doing in there? Nothing good. Screw this. Blow that shit up. Wait. Jack considered the door. Maybe to the left. And for the second time, Marin's fire punched a hole through a wall without noticeably damaging anything else, like she'd crisped the outer layer of an onion, leaving the interior raw. The hole was a little bigger, and it took longer for the flames to vanish into nothing. Then again, she had been shot. You're a complete freak of nature. Your envy is unbecoming. When the last flame died, He checked right, then left, and found not a single pious shooter in the room. Chapter 9 
What the hell? Jack felt Marin's hot breath blow down the neck of his shirt. He moved further into the room, giving Marin space to enter. Clear. You want to have a look? Check for wards? Stinks like death. Marin tucked her wings in tight against her body to fit through the hole she'd made, and as she scanned the room for signs of magic, Jack checked her wounds. Three neat holes, and none of them had stopped bleeding. A thin trickle of red seeped from each wound when she moved. Her scales hadn't done Jack to protect her. Recent death magic, as in, the book's here now? Yes. She made a chuffing noise that warmed the air. Yeah? Laugh all you want, but you look like shit and you're not healing like you should. Her long neck snaked around, and her reptilian eyes burned with a subtle green glow. Your eyes are glowing. You might fix that, or I can just paint an iridescent X on your forehead. Her lids lowered, and when she opened her eyes, the glow was gone. There's a basement. In Texas? Maybe it's another exit. Jack felt more than heard a low rumble. Okay, there's a basement. He followed her gaze to a point a few feet away along the interior wall. He wouldn't have spotted it in the darkness. But knowing where to look made all the difference. You have enough juice to blow through that? This time, the low vibrating rumble made his stomach churn. Head injuries and dragon growls did not mix well. Someone was a cranky dragon. Jack's stomach cramped and his head pulsed anew with pain. A darkness choked at the back of his throat, stealing his breath. Death magic. No shit, he coughed out. Holding his side, he pointed at the trap door in the floor, but Marin's jaws were already wide. Orange flame burned through the door. Jack blinked through the haze. Stinging smoke hung in the air, and tears rolled down his face. The cramping in his stomach had stopped, so maybe they'd interrupted whatever the hell was happening down in that basement. He wiped his face with the hem of his t-shirt. Only then did he see that she'd blasted several feet beyond the door, and he'd been inhaling bits of dead guy ash. That left three death magic zealots doing who the hell knew what in that basement. He looked at the narrow opening, and then at Marin. Be back shortly. If that shit starts up again, torch the entire building. Marin huffed out a bit of steam. Then she sank down carefully on her haunches in front of the basement. Be careful, you ass. Jack lifted his gun in a salute and started down the stairs. The steps under his feet were charred, but they felt solid and held his weight. He trod softly, but what was the point? They knew he was coming. Then he felt it again, that terrible sense of dread. He swallowed and sped up his descent. The bottom of the steps opened to the right, so he hugged the left wall, hoping he'd be able to quickly sweep the entire room. Three more steps. One man with a gun, shooting. Jack fell to the ground and fired, again and again. The gunman fell noiselessly to the ground. The world around him played out in silence. Two men standing over an open book. One with a bloodied knife. Drops of dirty red dripped onto the page. One with a moving mouth. Jack heard nothing. Jack shook his head. The ringing persisted. He tried to lift his gun, but couldn't. The room was small. His body hurt. He couldn't think. He couldn't move. The man with the knife lunged. The knife. Don't touch the knife. Don't let the knife bite. Too late. The knife grazed his arm. Metal teeth ripped into him, chewed him. His left arm hung, useless. Jack fired wildly. Accurately? He fired again and then again. His ears rang and then his attacker fell. The knife slipped from the man's hand. Jack propped himself against the wall. His eyes searched, found, the last man, the minister, who had the book, who wanted the knife. 
I don't think so, asshole. Jack couldn't lift his arm, couldn't aim the gun, so he waited. Pastor Rick needed that knife. He scrambled across the small room, and Jack waited. Rick swooped down in a fevered frenzy, reached for the knife, and Jack shot him, right between his crazy cult leader eyes. And then he passed out. Chapter 10 Jack, Jack, Jack. Five more minutes. Just five. Jack, wake up. Five minutes. Jack! What the holy hell? Jack jerked and clutched his head. The instant his hands touched his head, he puked. Each retching motion acted as a sledgehammer on his skull. He was concussed, and Marin was yelling in his head. Very quietly, very carefully, he said, have you lost your mind? Do you even know where you are? Sure he did. He stopped and looked around. Shit. In the basement, of course. Status? Four dead guys. Three shot, and you toasted one. The book? Check. And the knife. Oh, hell. That guy slashed my arm. How bad is that? Silence followed. While Marin tried to sort out how to tell him the bad news, he used the wall as leverage and inched himself into a standing position. He moved his neck, his shoulders. His right shoulder burned. One gunshot wound to the shoulder, not bleeding, unless he rolled his shoulders. His left shoulder had moved, but his arm hung limp. His T-shirt revealed a scratch, nothing more on his forearm. One magical injury to his left arm, bruised hip, and a sore all-over feeling running through his entire body. Can you walk? Time to find out. He leaned away from the wall and his legs wobbled but supported his weight. Quite possibly. We in a hurry? No flashing lights. Yet. And that alone was disturbing. Good thing he wasn't actually looking to move out of Austin and to the supposed sleepy town of Lorietta. He suspected he'd just offed much, if not all, of their police force. He headed for the knife. Retrieving the knife. No! Jack stumbled and fell back against the wall. Stop that shit! Don't freaking yell in my head! Don't touch the knife. You want me to leave the biting knife that makes an entire limb numb with a scratch? Is that wise? Jack blinked. Wait, what the hell is going on with my arm? That's fixable, right? Sure. Shit, you have no clue. Nope. It's definitely a good sign that you're still alive. Good to know. He was too old for this shit. Jack pushed off from the wall and stumbled to the table where the book was still open. Can I touch the damn book? I think so. You're just full of information tonight. Jack gritted his teeth, then reached for the book, and it hurt about as much as he'd expected. Getting shot sucked. Book in hand, he turned back to the stairs. Surprisingly, it didn't take him nearly as long to get up the stairs as he'd expected. He only had to stop and puke once, and he didn't drop the book. Score one for him. He leaned on Marin as they walked side by side through the main room. She stopped when they got to the second gaping hole, the one that led outside. He walked ahead and stopped on the other side, swaying. When she joined him, he asked, Where's the body of the second guy you offed? You stepped on him earlier, behind the altar. You ashed a guy, and I missed it? Marin flashed a mouthful of dragon teeth. Then she turned and, in a blinding moment of blue, fiery destruction, burned the church to the ground. He choked on a laugh. The impossibility of it. The ashy remains he'd stepped on unknowingly, the decimated place of cultish worship. It was just too much. 
He knew it would hurt, tried to stop it, but out the laughter came, and his head pounded, and his shoulder bled, and his body ached. Let's go home. That was when it occurred to him how screwed they were. It was still dark, but Marin wasn't fit to fly. He couldn't drive, and even if he could, what car would that be? And where the hell were the cops? The cranky neighbors, the firing squad, the witch burners, anyone? They'd lit up an entire building, and not a soul appeared curious or concerned. We just wiped out the entire Laurieta police force, didn't we? Most likely. And the neighbors? Terrified and hiding? Do we care? Yeah, who gives a shit? Unless they're a part of the magic knife, bloodthirsty book cult, then maybe it's a problem. He tried not to slur his words, tried to walk straight, but he was doing a piss-poor job of both. Don't suppose you know of a healer in the area? Scratch that. Don't suppose you know of a way to get to a healer in the area? After a few moments of contemplation, they both turned to the old blue sedan with the torn-off trunk. Aren't you wishing you'd popped that trunk now? Marin chuffed out a warm breath. Her sense of humor was coming back. Maybe she was starting to heal. We gonna do this? Hell yes. Those wings will work like a rudder, in a pinch, if I start to pass out, right? Why not? So with Marin perched precariously atop the sedan and camouflaging herself as best she could, and Jack driving, one-armed, they pulled out of the church of the book's parking lot in their stolen, shredded car. Jack glanced once in the rearview mirror. All he could see was charred rubble. The sight was more satisfying than a local brew with a medium-rare steak. Epilogue Jack felt someone shaking his arm. He opened his eyes to a blurry image of Marin in the driver's seat of a strange car. Five more minutes, Mom. Cute. You're home. He rubbed his eyes, then looked out the window to find them parked in his driveway. Wait, wasn't I driving? Weren't you a dragon? He jerked upright in the passenger seat. And we were in a sedan. How do we get in this car? Good Lord, the healer said you'd have some holes in your memory, but this is ridiculous. She sighed. You made it, mostly, to that healer north of town. Whoa, no way. That's like a two-hour drive. Yeah, Marin blinked two innocent eyes at him. Let's just be glad you don't remember all of that. What the hell did you do to me? Nothing the healer didn't fix up, good as new, so stop bitching. We're here, right? Marin tipped her head in the direction of Jack's house. Okay, outside of whatever you did to torture me, into consciousness long enough to drive two hours, what else happened? Clearly, he sorted you out. Jack prodded the back of his head. He'd acquired a pretty nasty bump earlier in the night. That much he definitely remembered. He couldn't find any evidence of it now. He sorted both of us out, even though neither of us understood how you were still breathing. That knife, the one I very specifically told you to be careful of, it's designed to drain your energy when it cuts you. Okay, but it's not like my neck or my groin was slashed wide open. The victims we discovered had lost a lot of blood, so I wasn't ever really in danger, right? Sure. Tell my dad and Harrington that. They're both in transit, on their way to pick up that completely innocuous knife. Marin shot him an annoyed look. You're a lucky bastard. Maybe he was. Maybe he had some kind of mysterious edge. Maybe the knife hadn't cut deep enough. Maybe they were all wrong about how powerful the thing was, or how it worked. Where's the book? Marin reached behind his seat and pulled out a plastic grocery bag. She raised an eyebrow. Think you can manage to hang on to it for a few hours? Dad's swinging by to collect it after he and Harrington secure the knife. I'll manage. Jack grabbed the bag. 
Uh, before we part ways, can you tell me what it does? I flipped through it. I didn't study it. And I can't read it. Right. Only a spellcaster can do that. But... But, underneath the stench of death magic, it definitely has a geolocator vibe. If I had to guess, I'd say it's likely the magical map of everything. Underground water supplies, rare minerals, hell. It might have led those goons that stabbed me and kidnapped you to the junk shop. Ah, your freeze frame in dragon form. I wondered how that had happened. Jack winced. Are we going to be reading about dinosaur sightings for the next month? The human ability to deny the existence of magic, even in the face of scaly, winged proof, is infinite. Jack hopped out of the car. He was surprisingly limber, considering the damage he'd undergone such a short time ago. Healers were a wonderful thing. So, no dinosaurs? She flashed a smile at him, a genuine one. Don't be foolish, Jack. You know I always eat the witnesses. After she'd driven away in a car he suddenly realized he didn't recognize, he remembered they hadn't discussed the partnership offer. Tomorrow. Maybe next month. He headed up the steps of his porch. He'd get around to it. The End This has been Spirelli Paranormal Investigations, Episode 5. Written by Kate Beret. Narrated by Roberto Scarlato. Copyright 2016 by Catherine G. Cobb. Production Copyright 2017 by Catherine G. Cobb.